We thank the good Lord for his mercies that are new every morning and rejoice in the day that he has made. As a commission, we are mindful to acknowledge that we could not have come this far if the good Lord had not been on our side. And for this, we are truly grateful. On behalf of the Electoral Commission of Ghana, I warmly welcome all of you to this meeting of IPAC aimed at assessing the processes leading to the 2020 election and the election itself. As a commission, we are keen to learn and improve upon our work, our processes and successes, and we place a high premium on this two-day workshop. It has been four months since we held the 2020 presidential and parliamentary elections. Over this period, we have reviewed the processes that preceded, characterized, and followed the elections to ascertain the resilience of our electoral processes and our performance at the just-ended election. And I know that some of you already have done this. Much water has passed under the bridge, but it is important to point out, it is important at a point in time that we must come together as actors and stakeholders in Ghana's electoral processes to take stock of the processes, strategies, and approaches we adopted in the 2020 elections, highlight the areas that need to be strengthened, and build consensus on a reform agenda for the Commission for the coming years. In this regard, we should collectively, collectively examine the challenges we faced in the electoral processes of 2020 and identify what did not work and why. This is important to gain insight and understanding of why certain targets were not achieved. It is equally important that having successfully conducted our general elections amidst the unprecedented circumstances of a global pandemic, we pause to celebrate the successes we achieved as a nation in carrying out elections under such circumstances with a decorum and a level of efficiency that earned us, as a country, the admiration of our neighbors across the sub-region and the international community as a whole. Why should we gloss over our achievements while the international community applauds us? As a nation, as a commission, and as stakeholders, it is important that we recognize the feats we achieved through the 2020 electoral process for the purpose of documenting best practices and experiences and to ensure that the successful strategies we adopted do not fall through the cracks of inordinate fault-finding and critique. Constructive critique, no doubt, is a vital part of any institution building and learning process, but so is celebration of success. Ladies and gentlemen, as, take in, as state institutions, we tend to gloss over our achievements and instead, as a country, we defo our default mode is to cast assessments and of public initiatives and exercises in the mode of a fault-finding mission, armed with a fine tooth comb, seeking earnestly to find fault. Sadly, we are slow to recognize where we have put good processes and systems in place, much less document them. In a bid to improve upon our past performance, we rush to propose new recommendations when the old processes and structures are working very well. We need to be guided by the adage, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. I have no doubt that in advanced democracies, achievements are not glossed over or taken as lightly as we do in our country. No wonder we find ourselves seeking to learn from ad advanced democracies when, in fact, we already have the experience and the know-how. 
Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, in any assessment, it is important that we understand why things did not work before we introduce reforms and new processes. We need to take a sober reflection and introspection on why certain processes worked and why others did not. I believe it is only after we have done this that we will identify reforms that are practical and workable. For this reason, ladies and gentlemen, let us not rush to propose recommendations for processes that are already working well. We must remember that we have to live with the recommendations that we make. But equally, let us not be slow to propose changes that address real challenges. Again, we must remember that we will live with the changes we failed to make. And so let us dissect our own recommendations with dispassion to ascertain their practic practicability and usefulness to the entire electoral process. As leaders in your own institutions, you do know that though some recommendations appear attractive on paper, they may not be practical in reality. We must remember also that our recommendations should be based as much on our achievements as our challenges. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, let us celebrate our successes of the 2020 electoral process and document them, for there's so much knowledge, good experience, and best practice residing in the Electoral Commission of Ghana. Permit me in this regard to take you down the memory lane of the election 2020 and list some processes we need to review, draw lessons and recommendations from, and document. First of all, we need to acknowledge the fact that it took less than six months to conduct a presidential and parliamentary elections that would usually take two months to undertake. We must applaud the hard work of the EC staff across every region and district of this country for the yeoman's job they did. From the introduction of a new biometric voter management system comprising new biometric registration kits to biometric verification devices and software through to the replacement of the entire voters register to the election day and the declaration, it took the commission six months from the 30th of June to the 7th of December 2020 to successfully implement all its processes. And we must applaud the good job of our staff across our regions and our districts. It is important for our work today and for future leaders and staff of the EC that we document how this was achieved. We need to celebrate the fact that in spite of the COVID-19 pandemic and its uncertainties, as a country, we were able to undertake all our electoral processes from the preparation of a brand new voters register with over 17 million persons in 38 days through to the exhibition of the register to the filing of nominations and to election day without the spread of the COVID-19 virus. And indeed, no life was lost to COVID-19 as a result of our activities. We need to mark and document the fact that as a result of the stringent safety protocols put in place, the number of reported cases stood at zero at the end of the registration exercise bearing in mind that the registration exercise was conducted at the height of the COVID-19 pandemic. How this was achieved needs to be documented as best practice. Again, despite the apprehensions around the COVID-19, the enthusiasm and participation of citizens in all our processes was very high and beyond expectations. Indeed, despite the fears of a low turnout, we registered over 17 million eligible Ghanaians in 38 days and recorded a 79% turnout on election day 
as compared to 67% in 2016. Ladies and gentlemen, let us celebrate the absence of long queues at almost all polling stations nationwide at the time when advanced democracies such as the United States of America experienced very long queues for several days at their polling stations. It is important that we document policies and processes that led to the absence of long queues. We need to celebrate the fact that for the first time in our history, the government of Ghana financed the, ex the elections in its totality, and there was no donor assistance or funding. This is something we need to celebrate as a country. We need to celebrate the fact that as a country, we successfully employed and deployed high quality robust technology to enhance the credibility of our electoral process. We successfully used biometric technology to ensure that only unique individuals were registered to vote, doing away with the phenomenon of double registration and multiple re voting. This is an important feat that needs to be documented. How this was done and the technology employed needs to be documented for the future. We need to recognize the fact that as a country, technology was deployed to enable a section of our society to check their registration details over the telephone at very little cost. In fact, for the first time in our history, registrants were able to check their registration details all the way to the election day. How this was achieved needs to be documented. And we need to highlight the fact that for the first time in our history, we managed to reduce the cost of elections by some 41% compared to the elections of 2016, in spite of inflation and hikes in prices. As a country, we reduced the cost of elections from $13 per head to $7.70 per head per person. It is not often that we hear such news, and how this was achieved certainly needs to be documented for posterity. We need to highlight the fact that, as a nation, we succeeded in saving our dear country a whooping sum of 90 million United States dollars. That is 522 million Ghana cities at a time when the cost of elections world over keeps increasing. And mind you, these savings were achieved in spite of additional costs associated with the COVID-19. And here I'm referring to the procurement of PPEs and materials and the airlifting of our offshore items, which came at huge costs. And the fact that in 2020, unlike in 2016, we paid full taxes on all items. Again, we made these savings in spite of the fact that the polling stations were increased by 10,000 and an additional 88,622 temporary workers hired compared to 2016. And so there's a lot to celebrate and there's a lot to be thankful for. But that is not to say that there's no room for improvement. For us at the Commission, the sky is our horizon, and we will not rest on our oars, but will continue to collaborate with you and other stakeholders to discuss strategies and innovations that will lead to the strengthening of our systems. Therefore, there remains much room for improvement. I'll now turn my attention to the challenges we experienced with the 2020 electoral process. One issue that confronted us as a nation is the phenomenon of rejected ballots. To date, in spite of the advances made in the design of the ballot, we have continued to witness a disturbing trend of a high number of rejected ballots. The Commission spent considerable effort in designing a ballot paper to reduce the incidence of rejected ballots. 
We did this by creating a huge space between each candidate's box to prevent the mark of a thumb from seeping into the next box. And yet, we recorded over 300,000 rejected ballots. Unfortunately, our laws do not allow us to take possession of the ballots until after a year. But we intend to undertake a comprehensive audit to determine the root cause and to find workable solutions to eliminate this problem. I'm sure this would come up for discussion when we come to that segment, and we look forward to hearing your recommendations and strategies even before we undertake the audit. Another challenge we, are keen to, we were keen to address, and we are keen to address, is the use of manual verification. As a commission, we are hoping to reduce this significantly as we used both facial and fingerprints to register applicants. My colleagues assure me that the 11,000 recorded instances of manual verification is insignificant compared to the number of persons on the register and the number of persons who voted on election day. Indeed, the 11,000 cases compared to the voter turnout amounts to 0.08% you know, of the total persons registered. And though that is insignificant, we are keen to find practicable recommendations to reduce this to the barest minimum. Yet another challenge that has been on the front burner of our discussions at the Commission is the perpetuation of the illegality of encouraging minors and foreigners to register as voters. During the 2020 exhibition exercise, we went to considerable lengths to collaborate with opinion leaders and civil society at the grassroots to assist the commission to expunge the names of minors and foreigners from our register. Very often we see fingers being pointed in our direction, as if to say that the commission registered the minors and foreigners. But we need to take time to identify the root cause of this phenomenon. And we often ask ourselves, now who caused them? This is, it is certainly not the Electoral Commission or its officials who cut illegal persons to the registration centers. We need to re-look really at our laws and provide stringent sanctions to perpetrators of this illegality. An exceedingly disturbing challenge also is the violence that occurred in about five centers and which led to the death of seven citizens of our dear country. Though the violence was not widespread, one life lost is a life too many. And we say never again. Never again should we go to an election and have anybody lose their lives. Here also, there's a tendency for fingers to be pointed at the EC when security is not the core mandate of the Electoral Commission. I read the Constitution, and security is not one of our core mandates. I use this occasion to clarify that the Electoral Commission is not responsible for election security. Although the entire electoral process and its success its success rests on the shoulders of the Commission. Our mandate, as entrenched in the Constitution, does not include security. We do collaborate with our partners, our security agencies, in, our, in their quest to carry out their responsibility of ensuring peace, law and order at all centers throughout the country. And indeed, we initiated a collaboration with the security agencies under the National Election Security Tax Force as early as 2019 to assist the police in carrying out their responsibility. We need to define clearly without a shadow of doubt whose responsibility it is to guarantee security on election day and to place the responsibility on their shoulders. 
Additionally, we need to provide laws to ensure that the perpetrators of the violence are dealt with decisively. And I take this opportunity on behalf of the Commission to call on the Ghana Police Service to speed up their investigations and to bring the culprits to book. The families of the victims, the citizens of Ghana, and indeed the international community are waiting for justice to be done. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I hope that together over the next two days, we can propose measures to address some of these challenges outlined. Some proposals we will put forward for discussions are as follows. We propose as a commission to close the polls at 3 p.m. rather than 5 p.m. In 2019, the commission announced its, decisions, its decision to close the polls at 3 p.m. rather than 5 p.m. in the 2020 election. Nonetheless, owing to the COVID-19 pandemic and the stringent and necessarily time-consuming safety protocols we instituted at our polling stations, we were compelled to put this proposal on hold. Over the past months, however, the proposal has resurfaced and from, we believe that this is a time to discuss it and to reach some consensus on it. Flowing from my experience in the 2020 elections, it was revealed that this is a workable proposal, as by 1 p.m., most polling stations were empty. Therefore, this is a reform we intend to discuss at this meeting today. Again, we propose to do away with the system of periodic nationwide registration exercise exercises and institute an all-round system where citizens who turn 18 or persons who have not previously registered may visit any district's office in Ghana with their Ghana card or passport and register as voters. This will help to do away with the nationwide registration exercises and go a long way to reducing the cost of our elections. We further propose a year-round exhibition system that will enable citizens check their registration details on their smartphones and other mobile devices. Citizens would not need to wait for an organized exhibition exercise to check their details. They will be able to do so all year round. Again, we propose to build further efficiency into our collation process by focusing on data entry only at the constituency collation center. This means that the entry point for data capturing into the system will be at the constituency collation center. The data will then be made available at the regional and national levels. Flowing from the data captured at the constituency collation center, the system at the regional level will generate its own report and at the national level as well without the need to further capture data and to input data into you know, the pink sheets and so on. The intention is that once the data is captured into the system at the constituency collation center, it goes into the system and it is available to stakeholders at the national and regional levels and the system itself will generate reports as a result of this. This will minimize the use of a ma the manual collation and will promote uh, accuracy and efficiency into our processes and ultimately help speed up the process of collation. Ladies and gentlemen, as you can see, we have much to discuss in the two days ahead of us. However, it is discussions such as these that have led to the successes I've enlisted above. And so I entreat that we enter the discussions with candidness, objectivity, and open-mindedness. Indeed, if we could reduce the cost of our elections to $7.70 
as opposed to the $13 in 2016, and saved the nation a whooping 522 million CDs in comparison to 2016. Whilst around us, the cost of elections are rising. If we could carry out our elections entirely with our own funds as a nation, if we could register an entire electorate in the space of 38 days, and if we could carry out our polls without lengthy queues and without a rise in the COVID-19 pandemic, then there's little we cannot do once we put our minds to it. Yes, the task ahead of us is huge, but with unity of purpose and with the good Lord firmly on our side, we will rise up to the challenge and we will see the Electoral Commission, our electoral processes, and our next voting day give us new cause to celebrate our own homegrown electoral best practice. May God bless our homeland, Ghana, and make our nation great and strong. Let peace reign. Thank you very much.